Hello and welcome to the Heads and Volleys podcast with me, Lee Dunn. It's been a while since you last heard from me and it's been, I think, almost about a month and I'm so deep into working through the A license here with the US Soccer Federation that it just consumes so much and if you're considering taking a license, I encourage you to do so and I saw a poll online the other day of somebody asking what they should do next and anything that you can do is awesome but just know that it's going to be time consuming so recently working through some game analysis and then analyzing a player individually out of that game analysis followed by periodization planning and then individual meetings with players and recording those and presenting those in relation to the individual feedback too so I've just been doing so much that I've been researching and and writing of topics and as I said in my last episode too that I have all of these ideas and all of these recordings that are going to be coming out real soon it's just a case of get into them like I am now and actually focusing on this because I think it's really important to not only be completely absorbed in whatever's going on around me so for example my A license and the coaching season and my regular day job too with San Francisco Youth Soccer but also to know that I love doing this and I love sharing what I do and I love putting my ideas out there because that's what this is and this comes from a lot of my conversations that I have with other coaches and in other environments and I sat in a coaches meeting last night and we talked exactly about what it means to be challenging our players and the considerations for our players that often go by the wayside when we consider the X's and O's and not necessarily who they are, what they're doing, kind of where they're coming from. So that's where my research and I guess scratching of the surface has come into for this exploration of the players that we work with and how they are multi-sport athletes. So I'm excited to get into this. I've done, I will connect all of the research that I found, all of the articles, all of the websites, all of that material will be in the show notes. So if I say something that you're super interested in or something you don't agree with, then I will let you know when it's an opinion and I'll also let you know where I've gotten things from. So let's take it away and explore what it means for us working with multi-sport athletes. I think I'll preface this with actually exploring what a multi-sport athlete is because there are athletes that can compete at the top level in different sports. Then there are the athletes that we're working with in the youth age that probably come from track and then are running onto your practice field or they play basketball as well as soccer or anything else that you would consider a child to be a multi-sport athlete. And the I talk about the periodization plan that I've been working through for the federation and it's the same kind of situation here just in in a lighter level of trying to understand what the player is actually doing so are they a multi-sport athlete and they're competing in track and they're running five miles in a race or are they simply coming from a basketball practice that they've done with their school because they like playing basketball and their friends play basketball so that's what their focus is but regardless of what the actual athlete is doing it's really important just to know that so right now i work with 12 13 14 year olds they're right on this cusp of growing or having grown or about to grow so we did a maturation test and there's about two years two biological years between 16 players so i have players that are fully grown with nice deep voices and then we have some of the boys who are still not anywhere near growing and one of them we joke about him putting water under his armpits to make the armpit hair grow so that's the the broad spectrum of player that i work with in terms of their maturation so then now I compare that to how they are performing. So can I expect a the player that's on the youngest biological side to perform and to be as strong and as fast as the player that is already or has already grown? So that player that is two biological years older than the other player. So I, at least knowing that, I can then begin to understand what that's going to do for that player in terms of their performance for me, what my expectations of them are, but then also, and here's what is the mind-blowing part, the 
conversation I could have with the coach of the other sport that the player plays in to then at least have a conversation as to the amount of work this player is going through. Now, some of the information I'll cover here talks about injuries and the risk of injury. And it's it's such a, a ripe time for overuse. And you think about players that are playing multiple sports or playing in different environments because they're full of energy, but their bodies aren't quite growing or are able to handle the workload put in on them. Then you also consider the most of the kids that I coach Their parents are infused by their activity. They think the activity is good for them. It saves them playing on a PlayStation all day or playing Fortnite. So then instead of giving them that option to do that, they are heavily scheduled and they're going and playing. And perhaps you're familiar with that environment too. But then think about these players that are now growing. And I always joke about the ones that you can tell are growing because suddenly they come and they've got new shoes and they've got, they need a new uniform because they've suddenly outgrown everything they have. And they all look like Mr. Tickle. They've got no coordination because they've got this whole new body that they are unfamiliar with. And so that's the player that I work with. And maybe many of you are in the same position too, that You just have to be aware or at least being aware of the players that you're working with then helps you to understand what it means for them when they're playing multiple sports or if they're not playing multiple sports or if you ask the question, should they play multiple sports or different seasons? So really understand your environment, I think, is the first thing I'm trying to get at here. Know who you're working with. Know what they're doing. So I want to go into kind of the argument for multi-sport athletes and this was a bunch of research that I did and and kind of stemmed from the conversations I've had with other coaches and then I found that Urban Meyer the Ohio State head football coach said that he only recruits multiple sport athletes so USA Today high school sports reported that a key factor to consider in sports specialization is the sport itself So the NCAA did a study of 21,233 student athletes and 68% of Division I men's soccer players and 62% of Division I women's soccer players were one sport athletes by the time they were 12. So 68 and 62% of men and women respectively were one sport athletes by the age of 12. Yet on the football side, the American football side, 71% of Division I men's football players were multi-sport athletes. And it doesn't give us any ages, of course, or how long they were multi-sport athletes for. But again, that's by USA Today High School Sports. Now, my theory on that, and criticize me if you like, or leave me a voicemail and let me know, but I think, and from my understanding of football, that most players or most people could play the game given that there's only a few select positions that are required for what I would call a football skill. So there are lots of players who are involved in the game, but I don't know how many of them actually touch the ball. So I think my bias of it is that you can afford to have multi-sport athletes. You can have these athletes who are track guys or soccer guys even because they can kick for you too. But then you're looking at a few specialized athletes. And I'd be interested to know on that regard, how many quarterbacks, for example, are multi-sport athletes and how many are single sport athletes, just to see if there is a correlation between the generic positions of football that are blocking or tackling versus the players that are actually performing what I would say as a skilled position, such as a wide receiver or a quarterback. I found some really good information on the Changing the Game project, and I think you should be familiar with it. And if you're not, definitely check them out. I'll put the links in the show notes, of course. But they reported a couple of things, and there's several articles on their information about the the benefits of being multi-sport athletes. And a couple of the points I picked up were, one of them was from a study from an Ohio State University, funnily enough, that's where Urban Meyer coaches, said that, Children who specialize early in a single sport led to higher rates of adult physical inactivity. And I think I can really connect to that. And kind of the sub message in that is that those who commit to sport at a young age are often the first to quit and then suffer a lifetime of consequences. So the idea is that you play, then you fall out of love or you're burnt out or you've worked so hard that you just want to give it up, but you haven't played anything else. So then perhaps you have a a track mind that says, well, I can't play soccer because that's all I've played forever. So I'm just not going to play anything. And I think I can relate to that. Imagine 
somebody who has played even in the NCAA men's study that were specialized at 12. Imagine if they came to your club at 14, 15, and you've said, uh, you're not going to make it. You, I just, I, you can't make this team. Maybe all their friends are on it, or maybe it's the only team in the club. So then that could be the knock-on effect of them saying, well, I probably just won't play soccer ever again. And I haven't played any other sports, so I'll just give it all up and I'll move on to something else. So I really can relate to even in my environment where I have players that I don't think will go on to pro and of course the percentages are really low anyway so it's probably a safe thing to say but that it's so still so important to be creating these lifelong lovers of the game regardless of whether they play other sports or not but I still want them to enjoy their environment or enjoy how the game treats them and it's not necessarily about trying to become a pro for most of them. So then there's another study <clears throat> with Loyola University, 1,200 youth athletes, and the measurement found that specializing in a single sport was one of the strongest predictors of injury. And they found that the athletes who, who specialized were 70 to 93% more likely to be injured. And along the same injury track too, female adolescents, there's an increased risk of anterior knee pain disorders, such as osgoslatus or uh, ACL issues. All of that comes from specializing in a single sport too. Again, that comes through from changing the game project. So there's some interesting perspective given by changing the game project there. And I think it's really valuable because it's super important to then see what we're asking of our players. So if we're saying you may not go and play another sport or I don't recommend and there's, uh, if your coach is out, oh, I'd never tell my players that. If you're telling them that everybody else on the team has chosen soccer as their main sport or whatever your sport is and the athlete then has this pressure to become a single sport player because they fear for their playing time or they are missing practice because they're doing something else so their playing time is diminished because they're not at practice however you feel about that the player is aware of that and there's going to be a decision that they make whether they say well that's enough now and i'll go and play that other sport because i get to play that or they quit that other sport and then begin to specialize and of course it depends on the age of your player and of course the NCAA men's uh, and women's are specializing by 12. So perhaps you're in that age range and I feel I'm in the same range. However, I think I'm working in a different environment than those players that are trying to strain to get to that next level. My final point on this is the reflection of 10,000 hours. And maybe you're familiar with it from Malcolm Gladwell, where he talks about 10,000 hours or the 10,000 hour rule, saying that if you are working specifically on a skill in a sport, that you should be perfect or as close to perfect and professional with after working at it for 10,000 hours. However, the counter to that, and again, this is all through Changing the Game Project, comes from um, David Epstein, and his book is really interesting too, The Sports Gene, where he finds that the elite competitors actually didn't need to spend 10,000 hours that they spend, for example, basketball, they spent 4,000 hours and were deemed to become professional or to be elite at that age when they were asked how long they'd actually practice specific basketball skills for. So then the argument goes that it's a misrepresentation that 10,000 hours ignores many of the elements that go into the high into high performance. So things like the opportunity that players receive, because you can go into then the argument goes that you can go into your backyard and practice for 10,000 hours. But what are you actually practicing that's going to help you get to be to the elite level? So whilst he 10,000 hours is on deliberate practice, there's so much more that goes into it for that athlete. So opportunity was one of them. There's also an element of luck. You talk about the outliers again from Gladwell and you look at when children are born. So Canadian hockey was the study and they found that all of the children that were in that environment of the elite level of youth hockey were born in the first quarter of the year. And maybe you're familiar with this. So the idea goes that they're born first, so they have more experience. Therefore, they are typically bigger and stronger and faster than other children born later in the year, even though they're born in the same year. 
at a 10 year old or a 12 year old, six months of difference is quite significant. And of course it doesn't matter so much as you get older, but there's still a significant percentage of difference between them. So therefore those players are gonna have more opportunity to get better coaching. So then when they get better coaching, they become better players. And the players that were born just a little bit later on have been left behind because they just don't have what I would call luck of them being born earlier on in the year. And then of course genetics too. So the fact that you've had six months to grow, but then also you've got the parent and the lineage that will provide you this growth. And my players all talk right now about how tall they're going to be because their dad is six foot four. And I said, well, you're hoping and maybe you'll have a bit of luck that your genetics will kick in and you will get that height that you so, so badly want. And then a study from the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine surveyed college athletes and found 88% of them came from a multi-sport background. So that's 88% of college athletes that have played another sport or played another sport as a child. So then the question is, how many of them, and here is where I think the US college system is really interesting, how many of them played sport in college to get through college or used sport as the vehicle for the experience that college provided, or how many of them actually wanted to go on to the pros? And I guess I am coming from a background where you're striving to become a professional soccer player. And so the environment is a little different here. And I remember a coaching course that I took and my instructor said that he realized he was in an environment that he didn't necessarily agree with when his best college player came into his office after four years of playing and instead of talking about heading towards the draft and trying to get into the MLS, he put his shoes on or his boots up and he said, that's it, coach, thanks for that. That was a great time and soccer's done for me now. So he'd used soccer for everything he needed and I don't know if he was a multi-sport athlete or not, but he had pretty much got to college and got what he needed and then had moved on. So if we're looking at individuals that are trying to go to college because that's their maybe their only means of getting into college or perhaps they just like the game enough to use it to go through college and they get the experience of being a college athlete then we need to respect that too and understand that if these stats are true in terms of the number of athletes that are, are multi-sport athletes and I guess not necessarily true but in terms of tying them into soccer even based before that we're looking at specializing at the age of 12 and the majority of athletes male and female in soccer are already specializing how many of them then went into the professional game from that that would be interesting to me to find out and i think that brings me on to everyone's favorite dutchman in raymond verheyen because he had a video out recently and he argued about multi-sport athletes and the, the benefit of them experiencing new environments and experiencing new games and, and all of the social development that comes with playing in a new environment with new people. But then we hear about all of these multi-sport athletes that make it to the pros and then he simply flipped the question and said, how many multi-sport athletes did not make it to the pros? And the idea is that the amount of quality time the players are getting in a quality environment focused on their sport as opposed to trying lots of different things and becoming a well-rounded individual. If we're trying to get these players into the professional environment, then he poses a really good question in terms of how many of them did not make it. And of course, there are no answers for that. So as soccer specialists, the data presented shows that there are multi-sport athletes in a lot of sports, yet soccer seems to be specializing for those players that are going to college. They seem to be specializing even sooner. The number of professional soccer players that are out there, I'm sure if there was a study out there asking them at what age did they specialize? And if there is a study, please share with me. But if they are arguing for or against multi-sport athletes, I would say that they are probably not saying multi for multi-sport. My assumption would be based on the college athletes again, that they are specializing sooner and sooner. And I think that's something that we can all become familiar with. So what does this mean for, for us? What does it mean for you in your environment of the people that you're working with? If you're working at the top level, then you will probably find yourself in an environment where the players are matching the environment. And I think this is something that can often be overlooked too, that this may be a coach created issue because 
I feel like I want everyone to love the game as much as I do, yet I'm not necessarily working in the environment that says or deserves to provide the player with a sole focus to get to the professional level. So I have players that come to me that love soccer. They will talk about soccer. They'll watch soccer. But then they'll also happily go and play basketball with their school friends. And I think it's really important for me to understand that and to respect that, that I go through all of this coach education and I work so hard to provide these in-depth plans and I work so hard with you as an individual when you tell me that maybe you do want to become a pro. So I help you create this pathway. And if I'm reading the data, it's lending towards you probably not being able to make it to that next level because you are not committed enough, quote unquote, enough to the game of soccer because you are going and playing other sports. Now, with that information, I can have that conversation with an individual and say, here is what the data shows because I have researched and I've asked the questions or I've, I've put this out there in a podcast that somebody may correct me or somebody may support me or back me up or provide me a different perspective. I can say to you, it's great that you love Chelsea. It's great that you really want to watch their games and you would love to go and play in their academy one day. But if I'm being realistic with you and if I'm being honest, I don't think that's going to happen based on this data. Does that mean it's not going to happen? Absolutely not. You look at players like Jamie Vardy who came through in England and players are still being found through his V9 Academy and they are quote unquote too old at 22, 23, 24 years old to become a professional. So who am I to say that you cannot but I'm going to educate myself as much as possible to give you the best chance. So again, to my environment, if I'm working with 12 and 13 year olds who are within a professional academy, then I think it's safe to say that my players, and this is a conversation I have, but you want to become a pro. Okay. Do you understand what that takes? What do you, how do you feel about your basketball team or your baseball team? How do you feel about your commitment to that? Given that I have been able to help you to understand the commitment and the pathway forwards to becoming a professional. And I don't know how many of us coaches are having those conversations. How many of you are actually sitting down with your player and saying, it's really great that you want to become a pro, but you're not going to do it. Or you're not going to do it when you are missing games on Sundays because Sundays is when your basketball team play. And most of our games are on Sundays, so you're missing out on these valuable opportunities to actually be playing. So really understanding what a multi-sport athlete is, but then also understanding how that applies to my environment. Then with the individuals, I want to know how hard they're working elsewhere. Now, if you're coming to my practice and you're coming fresh and fresh in terms of you haven't just come from a track meet or you haven't come from a basketball game, then I am able to challenge you through my periodization plan. I'm able to challenge you to the max in terms of you can play every repetition. You can work fully within whatever the bouts of work that I've got planned for that day. If you have come from a basketball game, that's okay because we understand who you are as an individual and what means what what that sport means to you or what that other environment means to you. I know that I can then work you into the bouts of work from the practice. So if I was working on four rounds of four minutes of a 5v5 mini game of some sort, now I know that you're going to be tired because you've worked for 60 minutes at basketball. So when you come to me, I'm actually going to have you as a bumper player so you can put the ball back in play really quickly for the players to work as hard as you have just worked at basketball. And then I work you in for a repetition and then I work you out for another repetition. So at the end of it, you are going to have worked just as hard as everybody else because we've had to add on your basketball. And maybe that's a revelation for some coaches in that the players come and then the complaint may be, 
oh, I'm so tired, coach. And as a coach, you're so frustrated because why are you tired? You just got to my practice. I'm fresh. The other players are fresh. I've got this great activity planned for you to really help you for the game this weekend. And you're complaining that your feet are hurting or you're complaining that your legs are hurting or you got hurt in another practice and you can't quite play as hard as I want you to in here. If I have that conversation with the individual and I do it early on with their IDP, with their individual development plan, and I ask them, what else are you doing? And the typical response is, soccer is my number one sport coach. I said, well, that's, that's nice, but what else are you doing? Are you playing other sports? Because if you are, then I know that. And it's not a punishment as some kids and some families may think it is. They think it may affect his playing time or it may affect how I, how I view that player. And in some ways it may affect the playing time because he's just so tired, he can't perform. He doesn't want to perform. And then we go back to the overuse and the injury risk. So regardless of whether he's a single sport or a multi-sport athlete, I know I should know how hard he's working. So therefore I can help manage the workload that he's going through. And especially when we did the maturation test and then we find that some players are right in the middle of their peak growth. Now we need to really look after them and make sure that they're not overstretching or they're not overworking because one of the important things they need is sleep. And if we're just killing them on the field, they're not going to be able to sleep because they're not comfortable. And then the, the true wonderful growing phase that they're all waiting for is going to be stunted in some way. So to wrap it all up, I'm really looking for you as a coach and you as someone who's working with these players to really understand who they are and to know that it's not a competition when you actually embrace who that kid is and what they do. If you can talk to the other coach, and this is another complaint I hear often, well, I won't work him as hard, but I know he's going to go and play basketball and that coach is going to play him the entire time and he's going to make him do runs and he's going to make him do all sorts. Think about right now, the fall season ending here in California, high school season's about to start in soccer. What's the first thing those kids get when they get to practice? Typically fitness, because the coach is coming into it brand new with a brand new team. He doesn't necessarily consider what those kids have been doing elsewhere. So as a coach of high school age players, I want to say to that coach, just so you know, we've come off a 20 game season and these players are in great condition. So you don't have to run them into the ground. Now, that's a conversation I can have because I understand the workload that the players have gone through and I understand what stage they're at in their career or in their seasons, even in the years of their maturation. So I can say this player is right about growing time right now and he's going to need some help. He's going to need some rest. If the coach chooses to use that, then great. And hopefully they do because they're as invested in the player as they are as in the sport. But I can do the best that I can do. So I can control my environment. I can encourage you as an individual to also control your environment and have honest conversations with your players about them being a multiple sport athlete and what that really means. Because I played multiple sports. Now, I guess I could fall on the other side of Verhain's argument there and say, well, I never made it to the pros maybe because I was too busy playing tennis and cricket and rugby and basketball and volleyball and whatever else I could get my hands on. I could do track and I could do all these other sports. Now, perhaps that's why I'm not a professional. Maybe that's it. But I'll leave you with the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine. And this will probably make you laugh, but their study on multi-sport athletes found ultimately more research needs to be done. And the quote is more research needs to be done to fully understand the benefits and risks involved in sport specialization at young ages and establish evidence based strategies that will optimize the sport experience for kids while minimizing injury. So we don't know. We don't know what we don't know. And this is one of those things that we just don't know. But if you can take away some of the items of having an individual development plan and understanding what that is for that kid and what they are going through every day. If you can do maturation testing, just reflect back on the podcast I did with Barry McCabe in terms of what that is for the individual and then determining actually what their biological age is and how if they are in the middle of growing or if they're about to grow. All of these things that I can then say We've got a tournament this weekend. I recommend you don't play basketball on Friday. 
or we have a tournament and you're playing basketball on Friday, just to let you know that your playing time is going to be reduced because you are also playing basketball. And that's not a punishment. And I know you want to do all of it, but this is for your benefit in the long run. So we need to know this. We need to respect it. And as individuals, we are not only coaches, but we can be mentors. And if we're helping these players to be honest about what they're doing and who they are, then I think we're completely achieving our job, regardless of we win or if we lose. So multi-sport athletes, they are wonderful, of course, as with any other single sport athlete too, but they just need a bit more care. And as an individual, we can really help them out when we just understand who they are. My thanks as always go to Tactical Pad for their software that I can show my players, whether they play basketball or they just focus on soccer, they can understand what's going on on the field just by a quick look at my phone and they understand whatever the practices or whatever the challenge is, and then away we go. And I also have a new friend too, Soccer Innovations. They provide, if you follow me on Instagram, at Lee Dunn Soccer, or even on Twitter, same handle, at Lee Dunn Soccer, you'll see me using the board with the players. And I use it with the second graders that I work with, and I use it with the 14-year-olds that I work with too. And I present the picture, or I give them the control of the whiteboard, and they move the markers around, and they present lots of what ifs, and they present what if we do this or here, could we move here? Can we line up like this? And there are all sorts of questions that come from them just having the board and just having a hands-on experience. So a huge thank you to Soccer Innovations for their material. Check them out, Soccer Innovations. You can find them on all the social media too. The same as Tactical Pad. Get onto them. These are the quality things that are helping to make your experience and your player's experience so much better. So much better. And don't forget to send me a voicemail. Your voicemails mean a lot. I love listening to them because it helps me either shape my opinion. It helps me to provide more information, whether that comes from my social media or into future podcasts too. So check out the show notes. You can leave me a voicemail. I love listening to them. Always more coming from me, Lee Dunn Soccer and Heads and Volleys. So look out real soon.